This audio program is about differences in intellectual capacity among people and groups and what those differences mean for America's future. The relationships that Richard Herrnstein and I will be examining here are among the most sensitive in contemporary America, so sensitive that hardly anyone writes about them or talks about them in public. It's not for lack of information, as you will see. On the contrary, knowledge about the connections between intelligence and American life has been accumulating for years, available in the journals held by any good university library and on the computer tapes and disks of public-use databases. People have shied away from the topic for many reasons. Some think that the concept of intelligence has been proved a fraud. Others recall totalitarian eugenic schemes based on IQ scores or worry about such schemes arising once the subject breaks into the open. Many fear that discussing intelligence will promote racism. The friends and colleagues whose concerns we take most seriously say something like this. Yes, we acknowledge that intelligence is important and that people differ, but the United States is founded on the principle that people should be equal under the law. So what possible relevance can individual differences in intelligence have to public policy? In answer, we ask these friends, and you, the listener, to share for a moment our view of the situation, perhaps suppressing some doubts and assuming as true things that we will subsequently try to prove are true. Here is our story. A great nation, founded on principles of individual liberty and self-government that constitute the crowning achievement of statecraft, approaches the end of the 20th century. Equality of rights has been implanted more deeply and more successfully than in any other society in history. Yet even as the principle of equal rights triumphs, strange things begin to happen to two small segments of the population. In one segment, life gets better in many ways. The people in this group are welcomed at the best colleges, then at the best graduate and professional schools, regardless of their parents' wealth. After they complete their education, they enter fulfilling and prestigious careers. Their incomes continue to rise, even when income growth stagnates for everyone else. Technology works in their behalf, expanding their options and their freedom, putting unprecedented resources at their command, enhancing their ability to do what they enjoy doing. And as these good things happen to them, they gravitate to one another, increasingly enabled by their affluence and by technology to work together and live in one another's company and in isolation from everybody else. In the other group, life gets worse, and its members collect at the bottom of society. Poverty is severe, drugs and crime are rampant, and the traditional family all but disappears. Economic growth passes them by. Technology is not a partner in their lives, but an electronic opiate. They live together in urban centers or scattered in rural backwaters, but their presence hovers over the other parts of town and countryside as well, creating fear and resentment in the rest of society that is seldom openly expressed, but festers nonetheless. Pressures from these contrasting movements at the opposite ends of society put terrific stress on the entire structure. Numerically, the people at each end are a small minority of the overall population. The mass of the nation is in the center, and the resulting pattern is known as a bell curve. In America today, the lives of the majority in the center are increasingly shaped by the power of the fortunate few and the plight of the despairing few. The culture's sense of what is right and wrong, virtuous and mean, attainable and unattainable, most important its sense of how people are to live together, is altered in myriad ways. The fragile web of civility, mutual regard, and mutual obligations at the heart of any happy society begins to tear. In trying to think through what is happening and why, and in trying to understand thereby what ought to be done, the nation's social scientists and journalists and politicians seek explanations. They examine changes in the economy, changes in demographics, changes in the culture. They propose solutions founded on better education, on more and better jobs, on specific social interventions. But they ignore an underlying element that has shaped the changes, human intelligence, the way it varies within the American population and its crucially changing role in our destinies during the last half of the 20th century. To try to come to grips with a nation's problems without understanding the role of intelligence is to see through a glass darkly indeed, to grope with symptoms instead of causes, to stumble into supposed remedies that have no chance of working. We are not indifferent to the ways in which our research, wrongly construed, might do harm.
We have worried about this from the day we began work. But there can be no real progress in solving America's social problems when they are as misperceived as they are today. What good can come of understanding the relationship of intelligence to social structure and public policy? Little good can come without it. That the word intelligence describes something real, and that it varies from person to person, is as universal and ancient as any understanding about the state of being human. Literate cultures everywhere and throughout history have had words for saying that some people are smarter than others. Given the survival value of intelligence, the concept must be still older than that. Gossip about who in the tribe is cleverest has probably been a topic of conversation around the fire since fires and conversation were invented. Yet for the last thirty years, the concept of intelligence has been a pariah in the world of ideas. The attempt to measure it with tests has been variously dismissed as an artifact of racism, political reactions, statistical bungling, and scholarly fraud. By the 1960s and 1970s, it had somehow become controversial to claim, especially in public, that genes had any effect at all on intelligence. The causes of human deficiencies in intelligence, or parenting, or social behavior, or work behavior, lay outside the individual. They were caused by flaws in society. Sometimes capitalism was blamed. Sometimes an uncaring or incompetent government. Further, the causes of these deficiencies could be fixed by the right public policies. Redistribution of wealth, better education, better housing, and medical care. Once these environmental causes were removed, the deficiencies should vanish as well, it was argued. The contrary notion, that individual differences could not be easily diminished by government intervention, collided head-on with the enthusiasm for egalitarianism, which itself collided head-on with a half-century of IQ data indicating that differences in intelligence are in fact intractable and significantly heritable, and that the average IQ of various socioeconomic and ethnic groups differs. How much is IQ a matter of genes? The state of knowledge does not permit a precise estimate, but half a century of work, now amounting to hundreds of empirical and theoretical studies, permits a broad conclusion that the genetic component of IQ is unlikely to be smaller than 40% or higher than 80%. The most unambiguous direct estimates, based on identical twins raised apart, produce some of the highest estimates of heritability. For purposes of this discussion, we will adopt a middling estimate of 60% heritability, which, by extension, means that IQ is about 40% a matter of environment. The balance of the evidence suggests that 60% may err on the low side. In analyzing these issues, our focus will be on the relationship of human abilities to public policy. We will be dealing in relationships that are based on aggregated data. For example, suppose the topic is two 11-year-olds, one with an IQ of 110 and one with an IQ of 90. We are asked, what can you tell about the difference between those two children? The answer must be phrased very tentatively. On many important topics, the answer must be, we can tell you nothing with any confidence. It is well worth a guidance counselor's time to know what these individual scores are, but only in combination with a variety of other information about the child's personality, talents, and background. The individual's IQ score all by itself is a useful tool, but a limited one. Suppose instead that the question at issue is, given two sixth-grade classes one for which the average IQ is 110 and the other for which it is 90, what can you tell us about the difference between those two classes and their average prospects for the future? Now there is a great deal to be said, and it can be said with considerable confidence, not about any one person in either class, but about the average outcomes that are important to the school, educational policy in general, and society writ large. This makes a point so important that we will say it now and repeat it later. Measures of intelligence have reliable statistical relationships with important social phenomena, but they are a limited tool for deciding what to make of any given individual. The IQ score reveals little about whether the human being next to you is someone whom you will admire or cherish. This thing we know as IQ is important, but not a synonym for human excellence. The very word intelligence carries with it undue affect and political baggage. It is still a useful word, but we shall subsequently employ the more neutral term cognitive ability as often as possible 
to refer to the concept that we have hitherto called intelligence. This, we hope, will help you think of intelligence as just a noun, not an accolade. The 21st century will open on a world in which cognitive ability is the decisive dividing force. Social class remains the vehicle of social life, but intelligence now pulls the train, led by a distinct stratum in the social hierarchy, which we hereby dub the cognitive elite. Stratification by cognitive ability has been weak and inconsistent until this century because the number of very bright people was so much greater than the specialized jobs for which high intelligence is indispensable. A true cognitive elite requires a technological society. This raises a distinction that is worth emphasizing. To say that most of the people in the cognitively demanding positions of a society have a high IQ is not the same as saying that most of the people with high IQs are in such Hi, positions. I'm Kara. It I'm is like possible to have cognitive house. screening without having cognitive classes. Mathematical necessity tells us that a large majority of the smart people in ancient Egypt, dynastic China, Elizabethan England, and Teddy Roosevelt's America were engaged in ordinary pursuits, mingling, working, and living with everyone else. Many were housewives. Most of the rest were farmers, smiths, millers, and shopkeepers. Social and economic stratification was extreme, but cognitive stratification was minor. So it has been from the beginning of history into this century. Then, comparatively rapidly, with the rise of technology, a new class structure emerged in which it became much more consistently and universally advantageous to be smart. Now, we will examine that process and its meaning. In the course of the 20th century, America opened the doors of its colleges wider than any previous generation of Americans or any other society in history could have imagined possible. The growth in the proportion of people getting college degrees is the most obvious result, with a 15-fold increase from 1900 to 1990. Even more important, the students going to college were being selected ever more efficiently for their high IQ. The crucial decade was the 1950s, when the percentage of top students who went to college rose by more than it had in the preceding three decades. By the beginning of the 1990s, about 80% of all students in the top quartile of ability continued to college after high school. Among the high school graduates in the top few percentiles of cognitive ability, the chance of going to college exceeded 90%. Perhaps the most important of all the changes was the transformation of America's elite colleges. Starting in the 1950s, a handful of institutions became magnets for the very brightest of each year's new class. In these schools, the cognitive level of the students rose far above the rest of the college population. Taken together, these trends have stratified America according to cognitive ability. Education is a powerful divider and classifier. Education affects income, and income divides. Education affects occupation, and occupation divides. Education affects tastes and interests, grammar and accent, all of which divide. When access to higher education is restricted by class, race, or religion, these divisions cut across cognitive levels. But school is in itself, more immediately and directly than any other institution, the place where people of high cognitive ability excel and where people of low cognitive ability fail. As America opened access to higher education, it opened up as well a revolution in the way that the American population sorted itself and divided itself. The news about education is heartening and frightening, more or less in equal measure. Heartening because the nation is providing college education for a high proportion of those who could profit from it. Frightening because when people live in encapsulated worlds, it becomes difficult for them even with the best of intentions, to grasp the realities of the worlds with which they have little experience, but over which they also have great influence, both public and private. Many of those promising undergraduates are never going to live in a community where they will be disabused of their misperceptions. For after education comes another sorting mechanism, occupation. And many of the holes that are still left in the cognitive partitions begin to get sealed, because people in different jobs have different average IQs. Whatever the reason for the link between IQ and occupation, it goes deep. If you want to guess an adult male's job status, the results of his childhood IQ test 
help you as much as knowing how many years he went to school. IQ becomes more important as the job gets intellectually tougher. To be able to dig a ditch, you need a strong back, but not necessarily a high IQ score. To be a master carpenter, you need some higher degree of intelligence along with skill with your hands. To be a first-rate lawyer, you had better come from the upper end of the cognitive ability distribution. The same may be said of a handful of other occupations, such as accountants, engineers, and architects, college teachers, dentists, and physicians, mathematicians, and scientists. The mean IQ of people entering those fields is in the neighborhood of 120. In 1900, only one out of 20 people in the top 10 percent of intelligence were in any of these occupations, a figure that did not change much through 1940. But after 1940, more and more people with high IQs flowed into those jobs, and by 1990, the same handful of occupations employed about 25 percent of all the people in the top tenth of intelligence. During the same period, IQ became more important for business executives. In 1900, the CEO of a large company was likely to be a wasp born into affluence. He may have been bright, but that was not mainly how he was chosen. Much was still the same as late as 1950. The next three decades saw a great social leveling, as the executive suites filled with bright people who could maximize corporate profits. And never mind if they came from the wrong side of the tracks or worshipped at a temple instead of a church. Meanwhile, the college degree became a requirement for many business positions, and graduate education went from a rarity to a commonplace among senior executives. When one combines the people known to be in high IQ professions with estimates of the numbers of business executives who are drawn from the top tenth in cognitive ability, the results do not leave much room for maneuver. The specific proportions are open to argument, but the main point seems beyond dispute. Even as recently as mid-century, America was still a society in which most bright people were scattered throughout a wide range of jobs. As the century draws to a close, a very high proportion of that same group is now concentrated within a few occupations that are highly screened for IQ. This cognitive partitioning through education and occupations will continue. And there is not much that the government or anyone else can do about it. Economics will be the main reason. At the same time that elite colleges and professional schools are turning out brighter and brighter graduates, the value of intelligence in the marketplace is rising. Wages earned by people in high IQ occupations have pulled away from the wages in low IQ occupations. Another force for cognitive partitioning. Is the increasing physical segregation of the cognitive elite from the rest of society? Members of the cognitive elite work in jobs that usually keep them off the shop floor, away from the construction site, and close to others who also tend to be smart. Computers and electronic communication make it increasingly likely that people who work mainly with their minds collaborate only with other such people. The isolation of the cognitive elite is compounded by its choices of where to live, shop. Play, worship, and send its children to school. Its isolation is intensified by an irony of a mobile and democratic society like America's. Cognitive ability is a function of both genes and environment, with implications for egalitarian social policies. The more we succeed in giving every youngster a chance to develop his or her latent cognitive ability, the more we equalize the environmental sources of differences in intelligence. The irony is that as America equalizes the circumstances of people's lives, the remaining differences in intelligence are increasingly determined by differences in genes. Meanwhile, high cognitive ability means more than ever before that the chances of success in life are good and getting better all the time. Putting it all together, success and failure in the American economy and all that goes with it are increasingly a matter of the genes that people inherit. As May West said in another context, goodness has nothing to do with it. We are not talking about what should have been, but what has been. The educational system does sort by cognitive ability at the close of the 20th century in a way that it did not at the opening of the century. The upper strata of intelligence are being sucked into a comparatively few occupations in a way that they did not used to be. Cognitive ability. Is importantly related to job productivity. All of these trends will continue under any social policy.
we are optimistic enough to believe that no administration, left or right, is going to impede the education of the brightest or forbid the brightest from entering the most cognitively demanding occupations or find a way to keep employers from rewarding productivity. But we are not so optimistic that we can overlook dark shadows accompanying the trends. As we move on, here is a topic to keep in the back of your mind. What if the cognitive elite were to become not only richer than everyone else, increasingly segregated, and more genetically distinct as time goes on, but were also to acquire common political interests? What might those interests be, and how congruent might they be with a free society? How decisively could the cognitive elite affect policy if it were to acquire such a common political interest? We will return to these issues later. First, we must explore the social problems that might help create such a new political coalition. How much does intelligence have to do with America's most pressing social problems? The short answer is quite a lot, and the reason is that different levels of cognitive ability are associated with different patterns of social behavior. High cognitive ability is generally associated with socially desirable behaviors, low cognitive ability with socially undesirable ones. Generally associated with does not mean coincident with. For virtually all of the topics we will be discussing, cognitive ability accounts for only small to middling proportions of the variation among people. It almost always explains less than 20% of the variance, to use the statistician's term, usually less than 10%, and often less than 5%. What this means in English is that you cannot predict what a given person will do from his IQ score, a point that we have made earlier and will make again, for it needs repeating. On the other hand, despite the low association at the individual level, large differences in social behavior separate groups of people when the groups differ intellectually on the average. We believe that intelligence itself not just its correlation with socioeconomic status, is responsible for these group differences. Our thesis appears to be radical, judging from its neglect by other social scientists. Could low intelligence possibly be a cause of irresponsible childbearing and parenting behaviors, for example? Scholars of childbearing and parenting do not seem to think so. Could low intelligence possibly be a cause of unemployment or poverty? Only a scattering of economists have broached the possibility. This neglect points to a gaping hole in the state of knowledge about social behavior. It is not that cognitive ability has been considered and found inconsequential, but that it has barely been considered at all. We must add cognitive ability to the mix of variables that social scientists have traditionally used, clearing away some of the mystery that has surrounded the nation's most serious social problems. People must recognize that cognitive ability is an important factor in thinking about the nature of the present problems, whether or not cognitive ability is a cause. For example, if many of the single women who have babies also have low IQ, it makes no difference in one sense whether the low IQ caused them to have the babies or whether the path of causation takes a more winding route. The reality that less intelligent women have most of the out-of-wedlock babies affects and constrains public policy, whatever the path of causation. The simple correlation, unadjusted for other factors, what social scientists call the zero-order correlation between cognitive ability and social behaviors is socially important. At this point in our analysis, we are limiting the research to whites, and more specifically to non-Latino whites. This is, we think, the best way to make yet another central point. Cognitive ability affects social behavior without regard to race or ethnicity. The influence of race and ethnicity will be dealt with later, but first we turn to an examination of poverty and other social problems among whites. Who becomes poor? One familiar answer is that people who are unlucky enough to be born to poor parents become poor. There is some truth to this. Whites who grow up in the worst 5% of socioeconomic circumstances are eight times more likely to fall below the poverty line than those growing up in the top 5% of socioeconomic circumstances. But low intelligence is a stronger precursor of poverty than low socioeconomic background. Whites with IQs in the bottom 5% of the distribution of cognitive ability are 15 times more likely to be poor than those with IQs in the top 
how does each of these causes of poverty look when the other is held constant? Or, to put it another way, if you have to choose, is it better to be born smart or rich? The answer is unequivocally smart. A white youth who is reared in a home in which the parent or parents are chronically unemployed, but who has just average intelligence, an IQ of 100, has nearly a 90% chance of being out of poverty by his or her early 30s. Conversely, a white youth born to a solid middle-class family, but with an IQ equivalently below average, faces a much higher risk of poverty, despite his more fortunate background. Among people who are both smart and well-educated, the risk of poverty approaches zero. When it comes to family matters, rumors of the death of the traditional family have much truth in them for some parts of white American society, those with low cognitive ability and little education, and much less truth for the college-educated and very bright Americans of all educational levels. In this instance, cognitive ability and education appear to play mutually reinforcing but also independent roles. For marriage, the general rule is that the more intelligent get married at higher rates than the less intelligent. This relationship, which applies across the range of intelligence, is obscured among people with high levels of education because college and graduate school are powerful delayers of marriage. Divorce has long been more prevalent in the lower socioeconomic and educational brackets, but this turns out to be better explained by cognitive level than by social status. Illegitimacy, one of the central social problems of the times, is strongly related to intelligence. White women in the bottom 5% of the cognitive ability distribution are six times as likely to have an illegitimate first child as those in the top 5%. One out of five of the legitimate first babies of women in the bottom 5% was conceived prior to marriage, compared to fewer than one out of 20 of the legitimate babies born to women in the top 5%. Even among young women who have grown up in broken homes and among young women who are poor, both of which foster illegitimacy, low cognitive ability further raises the odds of giving birth illegitimately. Low cognitive ability is a much stronger predisposing factor for illegitimacy than low socioeconomic background. At lower educational levels, a woman's intelligence again best predicts whether she will bear an illegitimate child. Toward the higher reaches of education, almost no white women are having illegitimate children, whatever their family background or intelligence. What is the reason for the extremely strong relationship between low IQ and illegitimacy within the population of poor white women? The possibilities bear directly on some of the core issues in the social policy debate. For example, many people have argued that the welfare system cannot really be a cause of illegitimacy because, in objective terms, the welfare system is a bad deal. It provides only enough to squeak by, it can easily trap young women into long-term dependence, and even poor young women would be much better off by completing their education and getting a job rather than having a baby and going on welfare. Therefore, the results we have analyzed could be interpreted as saying that the welfare system may be a bad deal, but it takes foresight and intelligence to understand why. For women without foresight and intelligence, it may seem to be a good deal. Hence, poor young women who are bright tend not to have illegitimate babies nearly as often as poor young women who are dull. Another possibility fits in with those who argue that the best preventative for illegitimacy is better opportunities. It is not the welfare system that is at fault, people say, but the lack of other avenues. However, poor young women who are bright are getting scholarships or otherwise having positive incentives offered to them, and they accordingly defer childbearing. Poor young women who are dull do not get such opportunities. They have nothing else to do, and so have a baby. The goal should be to provide them, too, with other ways of seeing their futures. Taking the scientific literature as a whole, criminal offenders have average IQs of about 92, eight points below the mean. More serious or chronic offenders generally have lower scores than more casual offenders. The relationship of IQ to criminality is especially pronounced in the small fraction of the population, primarily young men, who constitute the chronic criminals that account for a disproportionate amount of crime. Offenders who have been caught do not score much lower, if at all, than those who are getting away with their crimes. Holding socioeconomic status constant does little to explain away the relationship between crime 
and cognitive ability. High intelligence also provides some protection against lapsing into criminality for people who are otherwise at risk. Those who have grown up in turbulent homes, have parents who are themselves criminal, or who exhibited the childhood traits that presage crime are less likely to become criminals as adults if they have high IQ. What is the logic that might lead us to expect low intelligence to be more frequently linked with criminal tendencies than high intelligence is? One chain of reasoning starts from the observation that low intelligence often translates into failure and frustration in school and in the job market. If, for example, people of low intelligence have a hard time finding a job, they might have more reason to commit crimes as a way of making a living. If people of low intelligence have a hard time acquiring status through the ordinary ways, crime might seem like a good alternative route. At the least, their failures in school and at work may foster resentment toward society and its laws. Perhaps the link between crime and low IQ is even more direct. A lack of foresight, which is often associated with low IQ, raises the attractions of the immediate gains from crime and lowers the strengths of the deterrents which come later if they come at all. To a person of low intelligence, the threats of apprehension and prison may fade to meaninglessness. They are too abstract, too far in the future, too uncertain. Low IQ may be part of a broader complex of factors, an appetite for danger, a stronger-than-average hunger for the things that you can get only by stealing if you cannot buy them, an antipathy toward conventionality, an insensitivity to pain or to social ostracism, and a host of derangements of various sorts combined with low IQ may set the stage for a criminal career. Finally, there are moral considerations. Perhaps the ethical principles for not committing crimes are less accessible or less persuasive to people of low intelligence. They find it harder to understand why robbing someone is wrong, find it harder to appreciate the values of civil and cooperative social life, and accordingly are less inhibited from acting in ways that are hurtful to other people and to the community at large. By now you will already be anticipating the usual caution. Despite the relationship of low IQ to criminality, the great majority of people with low cognitive ability are law-abiding. We will also take this opportunity to note that the increase in crime over the last 30 years, like the increases in illegitimacy and welfare, cannot be attributed to changes in intelligence, but rather must be blamed on other factors which may have put people of low cognitive ability at greater risk than before. In trying to understand how to deal with a crime problem, much of the attention now given to problems of poverty and unemployment should be shifted to another question altogether, coping with cognitive disadvantage. We will return to this question later when we consider policy changes that might make it easier for everyone to live within the law. Thus far, we have taken on social behaviors one at a time, focusing on causal roles with the analysis restricted to whites. Now we turn to the national scene. This means considering all races and ethnic groups, which leads to the most controversial issues we will discuss. These are ethnic differences in cognitive ability and social behavior, the effects of fertility patterns on the distribution of intelligence, and the overall relationship of low cognitive ability to what has become known as the underclass. Despite the forbidding air that envelops the topic, ethnic differences in cognitive ability are neither surprising nor in doubt. Large human populations differ in many ways, both cultural and biological. It is not surprising that they might differ at least slightly in their cognitive characteristics. That they do is confirmed by the data on ethnic differences in cognitive ability from around the world. Such differences are real and have consequences, but the facts are not as alarming as many people seem to fear. Here is a summary of our findings. East Asians, that is, Chinese and Japanese, whether in America or in Asia, typically earn higher test scores on intelligence and achievement tests than white Americans. The precise size of their advantage is unclear. Estimates range from just a few to ten points. A more certain difference between the races is that East Asians have higher nonverbal intelligence than whites, while being equal, or perhaps slightly lower, in verbal intelligence. Turning to blacks and whites, a difference of approximately 15 IQ points has been observed since intelligence tests began. Attempts to explain the difference in terms of test bias have failed. The tests have approximately equal predictive force for whites and blacks. In the past few decades, the gap between blacks and whites narrowed by perhaps three IQ points. 
The narrowing appears to have been mainly caused by a shrinking number of very low scores in the black population rather than an increasing number of high scores. Improvements in the economic circumstances of blacks, in the quality of the schools they attend, in better public health, and perhaps also diminishing racism may be narrowing the gap. The debate about whether and how much genes and environment have to do with ethnic differences remains unresolved. The main point, however, is not who will eventually turn out to be right, but that the answer makes no practical difference in how individuals deal with each other. The real danger is that the elite wisdom on ethnic differences, that such differences cannot exist, will shift to opposite and equally unjustified extremes. Open and informed discussion is the one certain way to protect society from the dangers of one extreme view or the other. Now for a more detailed analysis. Ethnic differences in measured cognitive ability have been found throughout the century and in many parts of the world. The battle over the meaning of these differences is largely responsible for today's controversy over intelligence testing itself. Our primary purpose is to lay out a set of statements, as precise as the state of knowledge permits, about what is currently known about the size, nature, validity, and persistence of ethnic differences on measures of cognitive ability. A secondary purpose is to try to induce clarity in ways of thinking about ethnic differences, for discussions about such differences tend to run away with themselves, blending issues of fact, theory, ethics, and public policy that need to be separated. The first thing to remember is that the differences among individuals are far greater than the differences between groups. If all the ethnic differences in intelligence evaporated overnight, most of the intellectual variation in America would endure. The remaining inequality would still strain the political process because differences in cognitive ability are problematic even in ethnically homogeneous societies. But the politics of cognitive inequality get hotter, sometimes too hot to handle, when they are attached to the politics of ethnicity. We believe that the best way to keep the temperature down is to work through the main facts carefully and methodically. We frequently use the word ethnic rather than race because race is such a difficult concept to employ in the American context. What does it mean to be black in America, in racial terms, when the word black or African-American can be used for people whose ancestry is more European than African? How are we to classify a person whose parents hail from Panama, but whose ancestry is predominantly African? Is he a Latino? A black? The rule we follow here is to classify people according to the way they classify themselves. The studies of blacks or Latinos or Asians who live in America generally denote people who say they are black, Latino, or Asian. No more, no less. This prompts a second point to be understood at the outset. There are differences between races, and they are the rule, not the exception. That assertion may seem controversial to some listeners, but it verges on tautology. Races are, by definition, groups of people who differ in characteristic ways. Intellectual fashion has dictated that all differences must be denied, except the absolutely undeniable differences in appearance. But nothing in biology says this should be so. On the contrary, race differences are varied and complex, and they make the human species more adaptable and more interesting. So much for preliminaries. Answers to commonly asked questions will follow, beginning with the basics and moving into successively more complicated issues. The black-white difference receives by far the most detailed examination because it is the most controversial and has the widest social ramifications. But the most common question we have been asked in recent years has not been about blacks but about Asians, as Americans have watched the spectacular economic success of the Pacific Rim nations at a distance and, closer to home, become accustomed to seeing Asian immigrant children collecting top academic honors in America's schools. This leads to our first question. Do Asians have higher IQs than whites? The answer is probably yes, if Asian refers to the Japanese and Chinese, and perhaps also Koreans, whom we refer to here as East Asians. How much higher is still unclear. In our judgment, the balance of the evidence supports the proposition that the overall East Asian mean is higher than the white mean. If we had to put a number on it, three IQ points currently most resembles a consensus, tentative though it still is. Next question. Do blacks score differently from whites on standardized tests of cognitive ability? If the samples are chosen to be representative of the American population, 
The answer has been yes for every known test of cognitive ability that meets basic psychometric standards of reliability and validity. The answer is also yes for almost all of the studies in which the black and white samples are matched on some special characteristics, samples of juvenile delinquents, for example, or of graduate students. Of course, there are exceptions. Next question. How large is the black-white difference? The usual answer to this question is one standard deviation. A standard deviation is a common language for expressing test scores above and below the mean. For example, for a test distributed normally, a person whose score is one standard deviation below the mean is at the 16th percentile. A person whose score is one standard deviation above the mean is at the 84th percentile. Or, in short, as a measure of distance from the mean, one standard deviation means big, two standard deviations means very big, and three standard deviations means huge. In discussing IQ tests, the black mean is commonly given as 85, the white mean as 100, and one standard deviation as 15. Translated into centiles, this means that the average white person tests higher than about 84% of the population of blacks and that the average black person tests higher than about 16% of the population of whites. A difference of this magnitude should be thought of in several ways. Recall first that the American black population numbers more than 30 million people. Of those, about 100,000 people have IQs of 125 or higher. 100,000 is a lot of people. It should be no surprise to see, as one does every day, blacks functioning at high levels in every intellectually challenging field. It is important to understand as well that a difference of one standard deviation means considerable overlap in the cognitive ability distribution for blacks and whites. For any equal number of blacks and whites, a large proportion have IQs that can be matched up. This is the distribution to keep in mind whenever thinking about individuals. But an additional complication has to be taken into account. In the United States, there are about six whites for every black. At the lower end of the IQ range, there are approximately equal numbers of blacks and whites. But throughout the upper half of the range, the disproportions between the numbers of whites and blacks at any given IQ level are huge. To the extent that the difference represents an authentic difference in cognitive functioning, the social consequences are potentially huge as well. But is the difference authentic? Are differences in black and white test scores attributable instead to cultural bias or other artifacts of the test? We'll examine this question in two ways. First, we'll look for external evidence of bias. Tests are used to predict things, most commonly to predict performance in school or on the job. To use a concrete example, the SAT is used as a tool in college admissions because it has a certain validity in predicting college performance. If the SAT is biased against blacks, it will underpredict their college performance. If tests were biased in this way, blacks as a group would do better in college than the admissions office expected based just on their SATs. It would be as if the test underestimated the true SAT score of the blacks, so the natural remedy for this kind of bias would be to compensate the black applicants by, for example, adding the appropriate number of points onto their scores. This type of predictive bias can work in another way, as when the test is simply less reliable, that is, less accurate, for blacks than for whites. Suppose a test used to select police sergeants is more accurate in predicting the performance of white candidates who become sergeants than in predicting the performance of black sergeants. It doesn't underpredict for blacks, but rather fails to predict at all or predicts less accurately. In these cases, the natural remedy would be to give less weight to the test scores of blacks than to those of whites. A key concept for both types of bias is the same. A test biased against blacks does not predict black performance in the real world in the same way that it predicts white performance in the real world. The evidence of bias is external in the sense that it shows up in differing validities for blacks and whites. External evidence of bias has been sought in hundreds of studies. It has been evaluated relative to performance in elementary school, in secondary school, in the university, in the armed forces, in unskilled and skilled jobs, and in the professions. Overwhelmingly, the evidence is that the major standardized tests used to help make school and job decisions do not underpredict black performance, nor does the expert community 
find any other general or systematic difference in the predictive accuracy of tests for blacks and whites. Now let's examine internal evidence of bias. Predictive validity is the ultimate criterion for bias because it involves the proof of the pudding for any test. But although predictive validity is in a technical sense the decisive issue, our impression from talking about this issue with colleagues and friends is that other types of potential bias loom larger in their imaginations. These are the many things that are put under the umbrella label of cultural bias. The most common charges of cultural bias involve the putative cultural loading of items in a test. Here is an SAT analogy item that has become famous as an example of cultural bias. Runner is to marathon as, envoy is to embassy, martyr is to massacre, oarsman is to regatta, referee is to tournament, or horse is to stable. The answer is oarsman to regatta. Fairly easy if you know what both a marathon and a regatta are, a matter of guesswork otherwise. How would a black youngster from the inner city ever have heard of a regatta? Many view such items as proof that the test must be biased against people from disadvantaged backgrounds. Clearly, writes a critic of testing, citing this example, this item does not measure students' aptitude or logical reasoning ability, but knowledge of upper-middle-class recreational activity. In effect, the SAT critic is saying that culturally loaded items are producing at least some of the black-white difference. Get rid of such items, and the gap will narrow. Is he correct? When we look at the results for items that have answers such as Orsman regatta, and the results for items that seem to be empty of any cultural information, such as repeating a sequence of numbers, are there any differences? Are differences in group test scores concentrated among certain items? The technical literature is again clear. In study after study of the leading tests, the hypothesis that the black-white difference is caused by questions with cultural content has been contradicted by the facts. Items that the average white test taker finds easy relative to other items, the average black test taker does too. The same is true for items that the average white and black find difficult. Inasmuch as whites and blacks have different overall scores on the average, it follows that a smaller proportion of blacks get right answers for either easy or hard items, but the order of difficulty is virtually the same in each racial group. For groups that have special language considerations, Latinos and American Indians, for example, some internal evidence of bias has been found, unless English is their native language. Studies comparing blacks and whites on various kinds of IQ tests find that the black-white difference is not created by items that ask about regattas or who wrote Hamlet or any of the other similar examples cited in criticisms of tests. How can this be? The explanation is complicated and goes deep into the reasons why a test item is good or bad in measuring intelligence. Here, we restrict ourselves to the conclusion. The black-white difference is wider on items that appear to be culturally neutral than on items that appear to be culturally loaded. This point is well established empirically, yet comes as a surprise to most people who are new to this topic. In any case, there is no longer an important technical debate over the conclusion that the cultural content of test items is not the cause of group differences in scores. Another issue that demands investigation can best be described as the motivation to try. Suppose that the nature of cultural bias does not lie in predictive validity or in the content of the items, but in what might be called test willingness. A typical black youngster, it is hypothesized, comes to such tests with a mindset different from the white subjects. He is less attuned to testing situations, from one point of view, or less inclined to put up with such nonsense from another. Perhaps he just doesn't give a damn since he has no hopes of going to college or otherwise benefiting from a good test score. Perhaps he figures that the test is biased against him anyway, so what's the point? Perhaps he consciously refuses to put out his best effort because of the peer pressures against acting white in some inner-city schools. Despite these suppositions, however, the studies that have attempted to measure motivation in such situations have generally found that blacks are at least as motivated as whites. Other kinds of bias include the possibility that blacks have less access to coaching than whites, less experience with tests, poor understanding of standard English, and that their performance is affected by white examiners. Each of these hypotheses has been investigated 
for many tests under many conditions. None has been sustained. In short, the testable hypotheses have led toward the conclusion that cognitive ability tests are not biased against blacks. This leaves one final hypothesis regarding cultural bias that does not lend itself to empirical evaluation, at least not directly. It is called uniform background bias. Suppose our society is so steeped in the conditions that produce test bias that people in disadvantaged groups score below their cognitive abilities on all the items on tests, thereby hiding the internal evidence of bias. At the same time, and for the same reasons, they underperform in school and on the job in relation to their true abilities, thereby hiding the external evidence. In other words, the tests may be biased against disadvantaged groups, but the traces of bias are invisible because the bias permeates all areas of the group's performance. To some listeners, this hypothesis will seem so plausible that it is self-evidently correct. Before deciding that this must be the explanation for group differences in test scores, however, let's look more closely. The hypothesis implies that many of the performance yardsticks in the society at large are not only biased. They are all so similar in the degree to which they distort the truth in every occupation, every type of educational institution, every achievement measure, every performance measure, that no differential distortion is picked up by the data. Is this plausible? It is not good enough to accept without question that a general background radiation of bias, uniform and ubiquitous, explains away black and white differences in test scores and performance measures. The hypothesis might, in theory, be true. But given the degree to which everyday experience suggests that the environment confronting blacks in different sectors of American life is not uniformly hostile, and given the consistency in results from a wide variety of cognitive measures, assuming that the hypothesis is true represents a considerably longer leap of faith than the much more limited assumption that race prejudice is still a factor in American life. Finally, are the differences in overall black and white test scores attributable to differences in socioeconomic status? This question has two different answers depending on how the question is understood and confusion is rampant. We will take up the two answers and their associated rationales separately. First version. If you extract the effects of socioeconomic class, what happens to the overall magnitude of the black-white difference? Blacks are disproportionately in the lower socioeconomic classes, and socioeconomic class is known to be associated with IQ. Therefore, many people suggest, part of what appears to be an ethnic difference in IQ scores is actually a socioeconomic difference. The answer to this version of the question is that the size of the gap shrinks when socioeconomic status is statistically extracted. The trouble is that socioeconomic status is also a result of cognitive ability, as people of high and low cognitive ability move to correspondingly high and low places in the socioeconomic continuum. The reason that parents have high or low socioeconomic status is, in part, a function of their intelligence, and their intelligence also affects the IQ of their children via both genes and environment. Second version. As blacks move up the socioeconomic ladder, do the differences with whites of similar socioeconomic status diminish? The rationale goes like this. Blacks score lower on average because they are socioeconomically at a disadvantage in our society. This disadvantage should most seriously handicap the children of blacks in the lower socioeconomic classes, who suffer from greater barriers to education and occupational advancement than do the children of blacks in the middle and upper classes. As blacks advance up the socioeconomic ladder, their children, less exposed to these environmental deficits, will do better and, by extension, close the gap with white children of their class. This expectation is not borne out by the data. IQ scores increase with economic status for both races but the magnitude of the black-white difference in standard deviations does not decrease. Indeed, it gets larger as people move up from the very bottom of the socioeconomic ladder. This brings us to the flashpoint of intelligence as a public topic, the question of genetic differences between the races. Expert opinion, when it is expressed at all, diverges widely, and there is a great degree of uncertainty within the scientific community about where the truth lies. We have considered leaving the genetics issue at that on grounds that no useful purpose is served by talking about a subject that is so inflammatory, so painful, and so far from resolution. 
We could have cited any number of expert reassurances that genetic differences among ethnic groups are not worth worrying about. And yet, people who call themselves Japanese or Khosa or Caucasians or Maori can still differ intellectually for genetic reasons. We may call them ethnic groups instead of races if we wish, but some ethnic groups nonetheless differ genetically for sure, otherwise they would not have differing skin colors or hair textures or muscle mass. They also differ intellectually on the average. The question remaining is whether the intellectual differences overlap the genetic differences to any extent. Our reason for confronting the issue of genetic cognitive differences is not to quarrel with those who deny them. If the question of genetic differences in cognitive ability were something that only professors argued about among themselves, we would happily ignore it here. We cannot do so because, in the public discussion of genes and intelligence, no burden of proof at all is placed on the innumerable public commentators who claim that racial differences in intelligence are purely environmental. This sometimes leads to the next statement, that the differences are therefore inauthentic, and that public policy must be measured against the assumption that there are no genuine cognitive differences between the races. The assumption of genetic cognitive equality among the races has practical consequences that require us to confront the assumption directly. We have further become convinced that the topic of genes, intelligence, and race in the late 20th century is like the topic of sex in Victorian England. Publicly, there seems to be nothing to talk about. Privately, people are fascinated by it. As the gulf widens between public discussion and private opinion, confusion and error flourish. As it was true of sex then, so it is true of ethnic differences in intelligence now. Taboos breed not only ignorance, but misinformation. The dangers of the misinformation are compounded by the nature of the contemporary discussion of race. Just beneath the surface of American life, People talk about race in ways that bear little resemblance to the politically correct public discussion. Conducted in the workplace, dorm rooms, taverns, and country clubs, by people in every ethnic group, this dialogue is troubled and often accusatory. The underground conversation is not limited to a racist minority. It goes on everywhere, and we believe it is increasingly shaped by privately held beliefs about the implications of genetic differences that could not stand open inspection.